Yes, we're live. It's me, Martin Cross, on Cross's Corner with Alex Partridge today. Hi, Alex. Hi, Crossy. How are you doing? I'm doing very good. Really, it's, it's such a pleasure and a privilege to talk to you. I've been really looking forward to this so much. Very excited. Um, we, we were talking before. I, I, for people that might not know Alex, you might sort of know he was kind of, uh, you can see the, the, the picture behind of, of the blades with the GB sticker and uh, the World Championship certificate. By my reckoning, two Olympic Games, medalled in both silver and bronze, uh, three World Championship gold medals, I think, and a World Championship bronze and silver medal. Started rowing back in, is that right? I think there are a few more medals in there, but yeah, I can't remember myself. So. <laughs> yeah, under 23 medals, junior medals, uh, rowed with anybody who's, you know, everybody in the, in the British team. Um, we're going to see what kind of a personality he is. I wrote down some words. I think inspirational is a is a massive word um, connected with you, Alex. Um, you're quite vocal in a crew. I know I've rowed with you in some of the old man's rowing that we, we do now these days. And uh, an intensity. You're very articulate. Such a thoughtful man, friendly and um, really unique. And um, I think we're going to have a whale of a time today. <laughs> Yeah. Um, well, no, I, I cross you. Thank you very much. The very kind words. And um, yeah, it is, uh, it's really special to have rowed with so many great people over those years. I was lucky enough to cross just as Steve was exiting the sport, you know, in 2000, I was just cracking into the team and rowed with some amazing characters. And then, and then a lot of the kind of new names uh, and even some of the people in the squad now, but what what's so great is we have our, have our little uh, legends group down at Molesy, which has allowed me to row with people like yourself and um, and Johnny. Although some people would argue maybe that's not uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, um, but you know I think it's so cool to have rowed with all these different people in in our sport from all over the world, and um, I think that's a really really special group to be part of. Yeah, and you, you've been quite active today. I, I don't know if you're out for a run this morning, but I gather you've just come out of the the Thames in Henley, which on today, which I don't know if it's the coldest day of, of the year so far, but uh, do you want to just explain what you're doing swimming in the river on a day like today? Um, yeah, I, I can, I, I'm not quite sure entirely myself, but uh, no, I... Um... I'm a I'm a massive advocate of of well being and mental health, and um, there's a guy that I follow uh, called Wim Hof. He's the Ice Man, um, and he's got a breathing uh, methodology and technique that I think is really powerful for um, uh, looking at really re re um, reducing um, inflammation within the body, but also anxiety and, and, and stress. But then the other element that he, he uh, has is this this cold therapy. Um, and so for the last um, uh, eight days, I've been jumping in the river and trying to stay submerged for between oh, five yeah. and ten minutes. Um, so I've li I've literally just got back off my off my lunch break of where I dashed for the river, jumped in and stayed in. And um, so I might be still shivering. <laughs> um, but you feel you feel incredible, and and actually, I have to say, my 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 body feels great. You know, by doing these things, by getting up early in the morning, seeing the sunrise. Um, you know, I try to do that every day, and run out in the world. You know, in the woods, in the trails. When I do those things, and I do something crazy like jumping in the river, you know, my day is okay, and I'm yeah. okay. And if but if I don't do those things, just because time gets on top of me or family commitments or whatever, you know what? It, there is a big difference and so it's just a simple thing to do but if you do it it makes everything else all right so what kind of space are you in now i mean you, you know chatting to you seem to be in a, a good space alex no I, i'm in a really good space i mean it's no it's no secret i i had a really difficult time in 2016 um you know i did some pretty silly things and um and and, and regret a lot my my sort of actions and behaviors but i went through a, a real tough process mentally um and a lot of that was to do with with sport and a lot of that was to do with just understanding me and life and and life outside of sport and kind of lots of things that have happened um and so 
it's a process you know i took it spent a lot of time looking at what is well-being you know what what's what are the components that make up your positive you know mental health and it's really interesting because if you finish a uh, sport as an athlete and you you think you think you know all these things you think i'm <laughs> you know i'm invincible you know i'm i'm so aware of what my body's doing today i'm i'm so in tune with and you are you are this incredible finely finely tuned machine when you're an athlete but also you have like a really really clear purpose every day you wake up you know it's pretty simple i'm trying to win olympic gold medal i'm trying to get into the boat that's going to win olympic gold medal you know so your whole life can be revolving around that but what what's interesting is that i thought i knew who i was i thought i knew what you know my values were why I was motivated to do all this kind of stuff in sport. But once you remove that, I didn't actually have a clue. <laughs> I didn't have a clue who I was. I didn't have a clue what my values were in life and, um, and uh, you know, why I did certain things and, um, and, and really what, what my purpose was in, in the world and all that kind of stuff. So I had to go through that process and it was not, it was not nice for myself and it wasn't nice for a lot of people around me. Um, and I was very, very lucky that they still supported me through that process. Um, um, but then by going through that process, you then kind of understand, OK, right, these are the components. This is like my training program outside of sport for life, my training program for the components and the elements that I need to be the best me. And for me, that's, you know, that is doing exercise every day in the morning. First thing when the sunrise is coming up, it is doing crazy stuff like jumping in the river when it's minus one degrees outside and i'm still shivering now but they make me operate at my best self for everybody else so yeah now i'm in a good place <laughs> that's great to know because i i do remember talking to you i think it would have been back in 2016 or um maybe a little bit before then where, where you were you know you talked about how it was coming out of the cavishan system and i think there was an image of of the gate sort of banging shut and that was it, you know, you had to give back your key for, but, you know, there was a life that you had at Cavisham and it was kind of barred off from you. And you were in this corporate world where, you know, Excel spreadsheets or PowerPoints with the, with the ergos in effect that you were doing, you were measured by. I mean, it, it was, it was a, a, a very, very compelling interview. You, you were talking very intensely about that experience. Yeah, I mean, look, I don't, you know, I wouldn't want today to be all about uh, the kind of transition from from sport to to life after sport. But it is it is a it's it's a well trodden path and a well trodden, uh, you know, well read story now where we see athletes coming out of 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 um, intense systems like we have with with rowing, with British rowing. Um, and, you know, maybe in 20, you know, th th during that time, uh you know i had a pretty intense view about that kind of cut off of the umbil umbilical cord i guess to to yeah. to your to your life when they shut that gate at kawashim and and yeah it did it did it, it was difficult for me um i look at it in a slightly different way now you know i understand it in a different way um uh in yeah. terms of you know i it's not um i don't blame uh you know cavisham or british rowing from my difficult uh, experience i think it's something that if you if you're not aware of 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 the journey that you're going to have to go on afterwards it's going to be difficult for everyone particularly with the yeah. intensity that's created the intensity that's created in that that system and that uh program that we that you have to run to be able to create success in 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 british rowing and in sport uh, in rowing in this country i mean i i do think that the level now with what the athletes have to train and the intensity that they have to focus you know there is a degree of just there is only a few ways to do it and if you don't do it that way then you're probably not going to create the success you know i was gonna say you know it, can you conceive of a uh, something else that might have been added in to when you were part of cavisham that, that could have helped things for you or you know that there, there, there's now and we can talk a lot about how british rowing is looking now but you know that there's a sense of uh, a more sort of cuddly feel around athlete welfare i guess um yeah i think i think um i think we have to be really careful <clears throat> now when we look at sport and performance in sport 
and athlete welfare. Athlete welfare and performance are two different things. And they, I think, I think to 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 create this world where it is, you know, all cuddly, cuddly, and you know, is the athlete, you know, there is a degree and an element within sport and within within pushing athletes to to success that you have to get you have to take them outside of their comfort zone and you have to push push different buttons that to, to get them there um and sometimes sometimes sorry martin I'll go, yeah i'll go yeah i'll go back cross a bit of a double feedback here. is that any different alex yeah that's my yeah yeah um so yeah what i was what i was going to say is that i think there's a there's a balance between athlete welfare i think just and human welfare and looking at that um and having some and uh having the support system for that specifically focuses on that um alongside the performance system and i'm not talking about athletes you know support i'm just talking they're they're, they're very different things um but you know, we need to be careful that we don't cost performance, the performance element, yeah, at, yeah. The, at, at the benefit of, oh, you know, let's just be all soft and cuddly and, you know, make sure everyone's, you know, because because to achieve performance in rowing in particular, there's a lot of pain, you know, it's really hard. <laughs> um, and sometimes you have to get someone to help you get to places that you didn't think you could get to. And, you know, I know, you know, Jürgen's now left, sadly left the British rowing team. And that was one of the things that he was, you know, he was excellent at doing and you know i didn't see eye to eye with him all the time but he definitely pushed my buttons to get more out of me than i ever thought i could and you know you hear about stories about uh, mike spracklin in canada and and how he you know how he pushed them and um you know so it's, it's a really fine line i think we need to be careful we don't go too far the other way as well yeah well you you had a very interesting relationship with Jurgen because you know he selected you for that Olympic four in 2004 which um sadly you couldn't complete that Olympic cycle uh, because of your collapsed lung and then he put you in the four after that in 2005 with Hodge and Williams and Reed um and and then he dropped you from the four in 2008 and you were in the eight that year um, and then you, it was very close whether you'd be in the four or the eight in 2012. And, and so you've got this very interesting relationship with Jürgen. Where he's, he's put you in boats and he's, he's whether he, and he's, I suppose, dropped you from boats. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, I have enormous respect and admiration. And, um, you know, I just think Jürgen is a fantastic coach. Um, we had a, a love hate relationship at times, but I think the best athletes and coaches often do because I probably pushed his buttons the wrong way sometimes and he did the same, you know, he did the same to me. But what he always knew is that I would always show up and I'd deliver my best um, that I could. Um, and I always knew that he would do the same. So, you know, I have a huge amount of respect for my time that I spent with Jurgen, you know, but the reality is, is he's he was the chief coach of the british team um and if you look back retrospectively you know that's a pretty ruthless role that you have to have because everyone in your team is training hard everyone wants a spot everyone wants a spot in that seat and um and not everyone can have that spot and you have to be the person who has to deliver that message um sometimes that message can be delivered in different ways <laughs> um yeah. the reality is you have to make that that decision and um you know uh, my 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 performance and my development in rowing you know over those years from 2000 all the way to 2012 you know it, it, performance isn't linear all the time you know you get better but you know you have bits where you go down and um you know i had some i had some down days and they were just some of the wrong days that that were important to, for selection so and and uh, there's lots and lots of components that make up selection for a crew it's not just about you know who's physically strong enough or who's won this seat race today or whatever you know you have to look at the full uh, psychological dynamic of the crew and um and i think the, you know the reality is that in the decision that he made in in 2008 uh, he could see that there was you know psychological stress within the crew we'd been together a long time we'd been winning for a long time um 
but we'd also not weren't working as well as we had done you know as a unit in the early years and um a great way of dealing with that is putting in someone different <laughs> so, you know it, it it's pretty simple um in that way and i don't hold it against him because i had a fantastic time in that eight in 2008 that was a an absolutely brilliant boat to be in and and i wouldn't have been gone on to be a, i think a much better athlete over the next four years unless i'd gone through that experience and and been in that eight you know i i don't think i was rowing particularly well in 20, 2007 from a technical perspective and then getting put in that eight, you know, and being coached by people like Mark Banks and John West, you know, they put, they put a lot of effort into my technique. And I think I then wrote a lot better subsequently, you know. Yeah. So you I think we can talk about you yeah. in, in, in those crews. I, I just wanted to ask you now, you know, Jürgen Grobber is now no longer chief coach. There's been a lot of changes since the new performance director, Brendan Purcell, um, has been in. We know he's he's not currently at work. He's he's off uh, off work at the moment. So we hope everything's going well with Brendan and, and wish you well. But um, what do you make out of what's going on with British rowing at the moment from from your position, Alex? Uh, I, I I have to say I, I I'm I'm quite worried. Um, I, I I you know the the fact that you've got one of the best rowing coaches in the world. Who's basically sat on his sofa less than four miles away from uh, the British rowing team, and you don't have the performance director who is supposed to be running the helm. I know they've got lots of good coaches down there, but it just doesn't seem to make sense to me. Um, uh, in the in the year leading up to the Olympic Games, um, I don't um, I don't see enough representation within. Uh, British rowing and the board of international experience of international rowing. Um, so I think there's a big disconnect there to um, governance from a corporate perspective to actually understanding what international rowing is about. Um, and um, I, I think I think that's quite dangerous. And I'm and I'm really worried about what's happening with the clubs. I just don't think there's enough enough comp interclub competition. Um, I don't think there's enough distribution of of athletes across the clubs. Uh, and therefore, the quality and the of the racing domestically is is not high enough. Um, and so, yeah, I'm pretty worried. Yeah, it's it's you know it, what you you wish for the best, and if the Olympics in Tokyo do happen, but it's it's quite a job. I think Jurgen had identified hadn't he an eighth that he was going to take of young guys and Mo Sabihi, and that was going to be his crew to try and win a gold medal. Um, but um, it's hard to see how that can actually go forward to win in this setup that they've got now. Look, I mean, it's up to, at the end of the day, performance is up to the athletes. And, it, and you, you know, you, as an athlete and, and good, good leader, leaders uh, within, in, within the kind of groups that I've been part of can drive that success from an athlete perspective. If they have a really good program to follow um and so it is up to, still up to the athletes you know how they how they train the intensity with what they train the culture that they create within their own group um uh but it's very difficult because without you know um and they do have a lot of good coaches down there supporting them so don't yeah. don't get me wrong i don't think they don't have good coaches down there but the one thing that jürgen was so good at especially in that last year, which was so crucial. You know, the Olympic year, we, we always knew as an athlete in Jürgen's program, you were training for the Olympic Games, and you knew that you at the Olympic Games would be the fittest that you could be in that four years. You might have ups and downs along, along the way, but you knew then you would perform. Um, and, and the psychological pressures and the kind of silliness that happens as, as an athlete, you know, the kind of... Um, infighting within crews because things that are not important suddenly become important you create your own problems you know the reality is it's pretty simple you know those problems don't need to be a factor in your performance they just need to get on and row and make it really simple you know but they do they do become a problem and that's where the leadership of Jürgen was so great because he could just poof, squash those out um, or say things that just just got everybody you know on the on the right track so um, you know, I wish all the athletes the best of luck, and I think it's still up to the athletes to decide how they can do it. Um, but they need to be focused. Um, they need to bring the intensity 
the same intensity that they think that they would have had if Jurgen was there because that was what you had to do. You knew that if you didn't do deliver every day, you were always worried that Jurgen would would drop you. Um, and I think the other thing is that the athletes need to decide to keep it simple so they keep those problems that we all have experienced in our running career that kind of make crews go slower. Um, that if they decide, look, we're not going to we're not going to allow that to happen, then um, then yeah. you know, they'll succeed. Yeah.